Lord, we thank you the drought is broken. And may there be no spiritual drought in our minds and hearts. Come and bless us this hour, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. We are all eddying specks of dust. We are all harassed, driven leaves. So said Bertrand Russell. And if there's no God, Bertrand was right. Because if there's no God, there's no man, only animated mud. No God, no meaning, no values, no immortality. So we have been looking at the reality of God and there are four main pillars. The first one was mind. You know there are billions of creatures in this planet that can think. How is it that mud can think? How is it that atoms singly cannot think? That atoms in a chair cannot think? Atoms in a car cannot think? But atoms in a human mind can think. We use our brains as we use windows. If you're looking at someone across the road, you never realise you're looking through a window. Windows taken for granted, and that's the way it is with the human mind. We deal with it as though it was a window and we take it for granted. But why should this agitation above our shoulders be able to picture the universe? A thought, how much does it weigh? Nothing. What is its size, length, breadth, height, thickness? None of them. And yet a thought can change the world. How is it? Why is it? That was our first pillar, mind. And then secondly, we looked at order. Whether it's a giant redwood or an ant, it is here because of miraculous code that we call DNA. A hundred million times more compact than the most compact thing that humanity has ever devised. Remember, three million three million cells in a drop of blood and in a typical cell enough information to make all sorts of marvellous machines that keep us functioning. So that was order, number two. The third one had to do with our quarrels. You know, it wouldn't be possible to quarrel unless both sides agreed on some standard of right and wrong. We could fight like animals, but the only reason we can quarrel is because we both agreed there is such a thing as right, such a thing as wrong. We all have an instinctive, indignant reaction against injustice, whether it's a child or an old man of 90. Let me read you something from New Testament, this is the paraphrase, the message, which is very good. This is Romans 2.14. God's law is not something alien, imposed on us from without, but woven into the very fabric of our creation. There's something deep within us that echoes God's yes and no, right and wrong. That's Romans 2.14 in this paraphrase, the message. Did you get it? God's law is not something alien imposed on us from without but woven into the very fabric of our creation. There's something deep within us that echoes God's yes and no, right and wrong. Were it not so, we could never disagree, we could never quarrel but because we do know there's such a thing as right, we do know there's such a thing as wrong, troubles, quarrels from sinful beings inevitably happen because we are not inclined to do the right and we are inclined to do the wrong. Well, that was our third pillar. The fourth one's the most important. 
you know, in a fight, go for the jugular. And the matter of philosophy and theology, the jugular is who or what was the young carpenter of Nazareth. He made such claims. He said he was the ruler of the universe. All power in heaven and earth is given unto me. All things are committed unto me. Before Abraham was, I am. Not I was. Before Abraham was, I am. The glory I had with God before the world was. Who is this carpenter that claims that all the angels are his when the Son of Man shall come and all his angels with him? Who is this that claims to be the Lord of nature? Peace, be still and the storm ceases. Who is he that says we should love him more than father and mother or son and daughter? Who is he? Who is he? This is the jugular. If we solve the issue of whether Christ was what he claimed to be, we've solved every other issue in principle. Every other problem that we'll confront in life finds its real solution when we understand whether the young carpenter was telling the truth or not. Who was he to say he was the ruler of the universe? Who was he to say that he could forgive sins? Who was he that could say he would one day judge everybody before the Son of Man would be gathered all nations and he'll separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Who was he? We looked last time at a few things. We looked at some of the prophecies, how the Bible begins with a promise in the third chapter that one day a seed of the woman would overcome evil and those willing to be saved would be saved and redeemed because of a seed of the woman. And then in Genesis, flood story, it's narrowed down. This seed of the woman would be a Semite. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. And in chapter 12, he'd be a descendant of Abraham. In other words, he'd be a Jew because Abraham is the first Jew. A little further on and we find Jacob makes a prediction about Judah. So he's come from, come from the tribe of Judah. And when we get into 2 Samuel 7, we're assured he'd be a descendant of David. And when we read Micah 5 and verse 2, he's to be born in David's town, little tiny village of Bethlehem. And Daniel has told us that it would happen within 70 weeks of years from the return from Babylon but then would come the great jubilee, making an end of sin, transgression, iniquity, bringing in of everlasting righteousness. It all happened legally at the cross. It's yet to be consummated at the return of Christ. Haggai said at the time of the second temple, the glory of this house will be greater than that of Solomon's temple, for the desire of all nations shall come. And the Old Testament finished saying, the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. And when we open the New Testament, he's come. He's come. So we looked at some of those prophecies. But we didn't look at the main one, and that we will begin with today. Isaiah 52, and you think I mean 53, but no, we begin at Isaiah 52 and the verses that close that chapter, beginning at verse 12. Before we look at this wonderful prophecy, may I remind you, I remember when I was at college in 1947, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, what's so great about the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, when they compared the scrolls, which were over 2,000 years old, when they compared them with our Bibles, and they particularly majored in this book of Isaiah, they found an exact parallel with the ancient Hebrew of 25 centuries ago and the Bibles that we now have. So we're going to look at something that was written over 2,000 years ago, translated into Greek centuries before Christ. No one can say it's after the event 
We're looking at verse 12. Isaiah 52. Let's move on to verse 13. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, his form marred beyond human great likeness, and he'll sprinkle many nations. Let's pause for a moment. Who is this man who had looked dreadful, disfigured, bruised, wounded, who would sprinkle sacrificial blood on the nations of earth? Who is that? Who is that? It says he'd be a servant of God's, but that's not the way you treat a servant of God. He'd be wise. Why do you treat a wise servant like that? It says he'd be highly exalted, and yet many would be appalled at him. His appearance is so disfigured. And when you think of what happened when he was whipped in Pilate's hall, think of how they spat upon him and slapped him, how they pierced his hands and his feet, cut open his side, pierced his brow with thorns. We can understand why it says many were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured, his form marred. I guess that would mar it, sure enough. Nails through hands and feet, sword through the side, thorns on the head. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. What a strange prediction. Someone who would be so wounded, so bruised, people would be staggered, and yet kings, when told the story, kings would one day bow before him. What they were not told they'll see, and what they've not heard they'll understand. Good news would reach the kings of earth. Now we move on. Remember, there are no chapter divisions in the original scriptures. These were put in by a man called Stephen's hundreds of years after Christ. So the next verses follows on. Who has believed our message? Though so wonderful, most people would reject it. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The arm of the Lord, some person doing his work. He'll grow up before him, before God, like a tender shoot, but a root out of dry ground. How can this be? A tender shoot? and yet a root out of dry ground. We don't want anything out of dry ground, but God is watching. He grows up before him, before God. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Pilate presents him to the crowd, bleeding, because of his whippings, that he had no beauty that we should desire him, nothing in his appearance we should want him, for he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. When he comes to the tomb of Lazarus, he weeps. When he comes to the city of Jerusalem, he weeps again. If you'd only known the things that belong to thy peace. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, we esteemed him not. New Testament says he came unto his own and his own received him not. The light shone in darkness. Darkness comprehended it not. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Please note that not only is this passage historically accurate, as foretells the coming of the Messiah, but it's doctrinally accurate. For example, it tells us in the sixth verse about the universal depravity of humanity. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. The Old Testament says in another place, there is none righteous, no, not one. So this passage is doctrinally accurate as well as historically accurate. When it says in the previous verse he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, the punishment or chastisement that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds 
we are healed. What a wonderful graphic picture of the Messiah's sufferings and his atonement. Please get this point. If you only carry this away with you this afternoon, it would have been worth your coming. Why did Christ die at 33? A man who could work miracles, raise the dead, cure the lepers, give sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf. Why didn't he linger on at least to the age of Methuselah? Why did he stop in Palestine? Why didn't he go to Rome? Why didn't he go to Athens? Why didn't he go all around the world? He could work miracles. He could have gone to pagan land. Why did he die at 33? I'll tell you why. Never forget it. He died as a sacrifice. That's why. That's why. He didn't come primarily to work miracles in many countries. He came to die for our sins. And a sacrifice had to be perfect. Once you get past 33, forgive me, you're no longer whole. After 33, you are beginning to go downhill. It doubles in pace every eight years, the rapidity with which you travel south. <laughs> All of us. So our Lord dies as the antitype of the perfect sacrifice. That's why he dies at 33. There aren't a lot of great athletes beyond 33. Not many. So here is the stress on his atonement for us all. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. You know, Pilate wondered that Christ didn't defend himself. Why didn't he? Because he was guilty. What? Christ guilty? Yes, he had our guilt. That's why Christ didn't defend himself. He carried the sins of Desmond Ford and of Joel and of Corin and all of us. He had the guilt of the world upon him. He didn't defend himself. Didn't open his mouth. Or oppression, oppression and judgment. Notice he wasn't murdered in what we think is the usual way. He was murdered by judgment, by trial. And who can speak of his descendants? What descendants? He's not even married. Spiritual descendants. For he's cut off from the land of the living. That's not dying of old age, is it? If you die at 93, they won't say you're cut off. But if you die at 33, that's different. Cut off. They're the words used by Daniel in Daniel 9. Messiah would be cut off. Out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. Over and over in this passage, it says he was innocent, but he died for our sins. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. They meant to bury him with the crooks with the terrorists, with the malefactors. That was the plan. And then Joseph of Arimathea says, no, I've got a tomb, we'll put him there. So he was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he's with the rich in his death, in a rich man's tomb. Though he'd done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Not true of any one of us. You try your best, you pray about it constantly, there's not one of us that doesn't violate the truth in many ways every day. All of us. We exaggerate, we underestimate, we misinterpret, we misrepresent. But for him, no guile. No guile. It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. What? God was in it? Listen, here's the whole Old Testament and you'll never find in the Old Testament that the innocent are the great sufferers. The Old Testament always teaches, if you're innocent, like Job, you'll always be vindicated. The New Testament doesn't teach that. In the Old Testament, prosperity was the reward of obedience to God. In the New Testament, adversity. What? Yes. Old Testament, prosperity. Hey, I'm a New Testament Christian, okay? Look for adversity because he's making saints and saints are made through pain. So here's a wonderful verse where it says, hey, it was of God that the innocent man should suffer. But Lord, that's contrary to the book of Job. That's contrary to all the rest of the Old Testament. Yes, Christ was contrary. Christ was contrary. It was of the Lord that he should suffer. Through the Lord made his life a guilt offering. Ah, 
Now the very Hebrew term is used as is used for the sacrifices in the book of Leviticus. He is the anti-type of the sacrifices. I remember once in America going to speak to a group where there are many what I would be tempted to call rather liberal theologians who did not like talking about Christ as an atonement. They liked to think of Christ as a great model uh, who would create a wonderful moral influence and be a great example for us. And so early on I took the text, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the remission of sins. Matthew chapter 26 verse 28. This is my blood shed for many for the remission of sins. And nobody piped or squeaked because there's no way you can avoid what the New Testament teaches. He died as a sacrifice for my sins and yours. And when it says here, a guilt offering, it's saying, hey, this was the antitype of all those sacrifices. He'll see his offspring. How can that be? He's going to be cut off and yet he'll see his children. How could that possibly be? Because he'd be raised from the dead, that's why. He'd prolong his days, even though he'd be cut off. Have you ever known anyone cut off in the midst of their days? The doc says it's okay, he'll prolong his days. Well, if he's a Christian, he might say that. But he means in the resurrection, doesn't he? But it doesn't say resurrection as a word here, but that's what it means, because he'll prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. All the early verses are about trouble, trial and suffering. All the last verses are about triumph, achievement, glory. All the difference between resurrection and the grave. After the suffering of his soul, he'll see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. Or better translated, through knowledge of him, my righteous servant will cause many to be justified. There's the gospel. And he will bear their iniquities again and again and again. Well, why should I bear them? Hey, the experience of guilt is normal for every sane person. If you've never experienced guilt, you are very abnormal. But what is this saying? It is saying, he bore my guilt, so I needn't bear it. I can get up in the morning and say, Lord, I messed up a lot of things yesterday. But this is the day the Lord has made and I'll be glad and rejoice in it because I'm accepted in the beloved. I'm complete in him. He's taken away my guilt. As the lacrimal gland washes the eye, so the righteousness of Christ, through his atonement, cleanses us from all our guilt and all our failures. Up to date, every day I can say, whatever happened yesterday, hey, I'm right in God's sight. That's the gospel. He justifies the ungodly. I figure that's me. Well, he justifies me. I never forget, many years ago, a friend of mine by the name of Colin, with whom I was having a lot of theological controversies, he helped with his brother set forth a new magazine for the remnant. And he began to publish, you'll never know what Des Ford is saying. He's saying that God justifies the ungodly. Oh, what a triumph for Colin. That Des Ford should make such a blasphemous statement that God would justify the ungodly. Pity he didn't read Romans chapter 4 and verse 5. Then Paul would have got the blame. And he had broad shoulders, better than mine. God justifies the ungodly. Hey, what a great verse. That's our picture. That's me, that's you. And he justifies the ungodly because Christ bore our iniquities. Therefore I'll give him a portion among the great. He'll divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his life unto death. Hey, that's not like being shot with a revolver, is it? Poured out his life on the cross, six hours dying. You know, I've got no fears whatever about death, but I don't like the idea of dying. And if it's got to be, let it be quick. 
shoot me, Joel, but don't, don't attenuate it. <laughs> don't attenuate it. But he poured out his life under death. Ours, numbered with the transgressors. That's why he's in the middle. He was the worst of them, they said. He bore the sin of many, the many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. What a passage of scripture. And the next chapter is about how the gospel would be spread to all the world by the church that would grow and grow and grow as a result of this. What a picture. What a story. What a story. Not only are the prophecies of the Old Testament about our Lord, but there are many acted prophecies and I remember it was nearly 70 years ago when I was beginning to study the Bible and I owned Encyclopedia Britannica and all sorts of books that more or less ran down the Bible. It was customary among the learned to be wiser than the book. And the thing that greatly appealed to me as a young student of scripture was what is known as typology. Now, typology can be abused, but abuse doesn't cancel use. What do I mean by typology? The Bible in the Old Testament has many intimations of what is to happen in fullness, and it foreshadows that fullness in a thousand ways. Let me illustrate. The first person known as the Son of God was Adam. He's called the Son of God in Luke chapter 3. He gave us life and death. On the sixth day, he fell asleep and his side was opened. And that which came from his side made his bride. And when we come to the one known as the second Adam, the last Adam, he too dies or sleeps on the sixth day. His side also is opened and the blood and the water makes his bride justification, sanctification. The first Adam who slept that he might have a bride is a picture of Christ. The last Adam who would sleep in death that he might beget us, his church. Abel, the good shepherd, killed. Why? What had he done wrong? Nothing. Well, why was he killed? Because he was righteous. Well, who killed him? The devil? No, his brother. And the millenniums pass and the real good shepherd comes and he's put to death. What's he done? Nothing, he was righteous. Abel, the good shepherd, put to death because his works were righteous. Enoch, translated without seeing death, physically taken up into glory. That would one day happen to Christ after the resurrection. He too would go up to glory just as Enoch did. Noah, his name means rest. You have 500 invitations of come in the Bible and the first one's associated with Noah. Come into the ark. Noah prepares an ark to the saving of his house. He's a saviour of the world. There's a lot of symbolism in these Old Testament stories. They're not primarily trying to tell us either science or history, but they're inspired and deeply significant. And Noah is presented as the saviour of the world. And he takes those he saves up to the heights, figure of resurrection, as it rests on Ararat. Noah, a name that most people have trouble with, Melchizedek. Who on earth is Melchizedek? Who was his father? We don't know. Who were his children? We don't know. When did he die? We don't know. When was he born? We don't know. Well, who was he? Well, he was a king. Is that all? No, he was a priest. Okay, where? Salem. Oh, same place as Jerusalem? Yes, same place. When do we first meet him? Well, he blesses the father of the faithful. He blesses Abraham. Now, who does the blessing, superior or inferior? Here's someone who's more greater than Abraham. And Abraham's the heir of the world, according to Romans 4. Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. But we don't know anything about where he came from, where he went to, about his birth or his death. And he's a priest and a king. What a wonderful picture of our Lord Jesus who had neither beginning of days nor end of life. 
eternal. The Old Testament calls Jesus the everlasting Father, or some translations, the Father of eternity. King and priests, like Melchizedek, ruler over the true Jerusalem, the holy city, the church of God. Superior to Abraham, he blessed Abraham after his warfare. He blessed him what with? Crumpets? No, bread and wine. Bread and wine. And when our Saviour came, in the symbols of bread and wine, he prefigured the greatest feast that's possible for anyone to have. Feasting on the atonement of Jesus, symbolised by the broken bread and the wine. So that's Melchizedek. And then there's Isaac. Well, Isaac was miraculously born. What? Another virgin birth? No, no. Well, what do you mean miraculously born? Well, his father was about 100 years old. You don't have many daddies at 100. And uh, women are worse off even. They, they, they cut out sooner than men. Men can beget children at quite an age, but it's not usually the rule with women. But here are two oldies, Abraham and Sarah, stumbling to the grave and miraculously they're given a child, the child of promise, whose name means joy, joy. But that only begotten son, as he's called, that precious child of promise is condemned to death and for three days he's under the sentence of death. Where is he to die? Mount Moriah, where's that? Well, that's Jerusalem, same place. Same place. And we see him under the sentence of death, carrying the wood on his back. Why? Well, in antitype, Christ would carry the cross. Well, what happens? Well, he's willing to be sacrificed. His father spells it out to him. Son, God wants you as a sacrifice. So the son steadies his father's nervy hands helps him tie the bonds, bears his breast and then God delivers him as from the dead, like a resurrection from the dead. And you know the chapters that follow are also typical. A servant is went, sent to get a, a bride for Isaac after Christ was raised from the dead. The Holy Spirit through the church gathers Christ's bride, the church. You even find the words of the marriage service in that story. Wilt thou? I will. Read it. Isaac. Jacob, most known as the supplanter. Well, Christ supplanted sin and Satan. Satan wrestles with, uh, Jacob wrestles with God, prefiguring Gethsemane. Think of Moses. There are 70 parallels between the life of Moses and the life of Jesus. Seven zero parallels. He is someone that's willing to leave the ivory palaces to redeem his people. Someone who's condemned to death when he's a child by a cruel king. But someone who is rescued. Someone who becomes a good shepherd. Then a deliverer. Someone who feeds the people he delivers with bread and water from the rock. Twelve tribes, as Christ has twelve disciples. Seventy elders, as Christ at one time has seventy going forth on mission for him. Moses is transfigured, as Christ was transfigured. Moses fasts forty days, as Christ was. Moses is willing to be blotted out for the sins of his people. Forgive their sin. If not, blot me out of your book. Christ is blotted out. He dies while his strength is unabated, his eye undimmed. So did Christ. Well, I've given you just a few. There are 70 parallels between the life of Moses and the life of Jesus. Remember, Moses said in Deuteronomy 18, 18, the Lord will raise up a prophet like unto me. Now Moses was mighty in word and deed. You have many Old Testament prophets that were mighty in word, usually not in deed. Then you have a few like Elijah who are mighty in deed. Well, they didn't write anything. They weren't mighty in word. 
But Moses says, there's coming one who will be mighty in word and deed. And when Christ came, no man spake like that man because no man lived like that man. Joshua, well, did I say Joshua? I mean Jesus, because Joshua is the Old Testament Hebrew form of the Greek word Jesus. Why is he important? Well, Moses couldn't take them through because he represented the law. Law can't get you into Canaan. I have lots of good friends that are trying to be perfect. Hey, what a terribly sad life they're going to have because the good book says in many things we all offend and whenever you pray, say, forgive us. So you can't get in by law. Can't get in by law. Moses represents the law. He couldn't take them in. Joshua, Jesus, same name, Hebrew, Greek. He could take them in. And he overcomes all the enemies of God's people. He gives them the inheritance, which is a figure of heaven, the land of milk and honey, the land of giants. Judges. The madman, the mad strong man, Samson. At his birth it was told he'd save his people. <laughs> he nearly destroyed them. He went mad, he lived it up. And the hair that represented his dedication to God, which he'd blasphemed, is cut off and he's penitent and begins to grow. And with his hair growing, so his penitence grows. And when they put him up on the stage in that great hall with thousands of the enemies of Israel there and here is Samson and there's a pillar on either side. He says, Lord, strengthen me just this once and he bows and he brings the building down and delivers the people by his death. Delivers the people by his death. What a picture of Christ on Calvary who bowed his head and destroyed the kingdoms of Satan. Samson, Samson. The one I like best is David and we could spend weeks on David but David's man, a man who's despised and rejected. He's anointed when he's 30 like Jesus. He's going to be a great captain, never lose a battle when he's fighting the armies of God. Only when he stayed home instead of going out to war did he lose a battle and that was because of a woman. No, it was because of David. No type walks on four legs. Every shadow is a distortion. But David is a wonderful picture of the man after God's own heart, the Lord Jesus Christ. Despised and rejected, ultimately king. Also a prophet. Also the leader of the armies of God. Born in Bethlehem. What's his name mean? Only one David in the Bible. Ever notice that? There's only one Christ. You know, even in the New Testament you'll find about three Judases. Did you know that? We have a whole book of the New Testament written by Judas. Only the translators are a bit weary, so they put Jude. But it's Judas. But there's only one David. There's only one Christ. And David was born in Bethlehem. And David means beloved. And then there's Solomon wisest of all men he builds the temple prefigures Christ in whom are, are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge who builds the church of God peacefully this is a religion unlike Ma the Muslim religion Muhammad got his thousands by saying either off with your head or become a Muslim that's quite uh, coercive that's quite persuasive but the religion of Christ says hey you can love the men, you can't drag them in. No force is acceptable to God. So Solomon, man of peace. Again, he's not a perfect picture because he's an idiot with women. Most men have trouble with one, he had thousands. The reason most men have trouble with one is because of what they are. If we knew how little a difference there is between male and female, physiologically, DNA, we'd realise that all of us have the capacities of the other sex. 
and when sexes get into trouble, it isn't adultery as a rule, it's just selfishness. But Solomon became an idiot because he had political ambitions. And the great thing about the true Solomon is he forbade his church to have anything to do with politics. I was brought up an Anglican and I happen to love the Anglican church. But the gr one of the greatest problems in the Anglican church is it is tied to government. Church of England, Christ Church refuses to be tied to politics in any way. That's why there are many Christians that do not feel at liberty to vote for political parties. They may vote for independence, but some Christians think they shouldn't vote for parties. Well, that's something we have to work out for ourselves. So here's Solomon, another wonderful type of Christ. There are whole stories in the Bible that are typical of Christ. Let's look at one, 2 Samuel 9. Philip, you can put it up for us when you're ready. 2 Samuel 9. I love this story. I was telling you when I was a young man, I began to study the types. I found I could laugh at all the critical theories because the types are so marvellously inspired and interwoven that only supernaturalism can account for them. Take this story. Look at chapter 9 of 2 Samuel. David, the beloved, the one born in Bethlehem, the king, the one despised and rejected, the one anointed at 30. Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They called him to appear before David and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? Your servant, he replied. King asked, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul? Remember, Saul's son Jonathan was a twin spirit to David. David and Jonathan. So he's trying to find any relatives of Jonathan, but he uses Saul's name as the one best known. There's still a son of Jonathan. He's crippled in both feet. Ah, here's an interesting part of the story. Here is a prince who experiences a fall in the beginning of his life and it cripples him for the rest of his days. If you can't see its connection with you, look in the mirror. We are the result of a fall at the beginning of the world and we were all born crippled morally. This Mephibosheth represents me and you Crippled on both feet. Hey, pretty bad. Where is he? He's at the house of Maker, son of Amiel in Lodabar. Why that? Well, Lodabar means a place of no pasture. This Mephibosheth, who's descended from a rebel against David, Saul. Jonathan was for David, but not Saul. This Mephibosheth... He's living away from the kingdom. He's living away from the throne. He's scared to death of David. But Lodabar means a place of no pasture. This is the same as Luke 15, where the prodigal son goes to a very far country where he lives it up. A place of no pasture. When you turn aside from the will of God, you go into nowhere. You go into a place of no pasture. And so here is this man that represents every sinner in a place of no pasture. That's what Lodabar means. So David had him brought. He wouldn't come willingly. David had to bring him. And you and I, by nature, don't love God. He has to move on us. The Spirit has to move on us. Only when we find out God loves us, only then can we love him back. When Mephibosheth came, he bowed. David said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him. I love these words. I'll surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I'll restore to you all the land of grandfather Saul. You'll always eat at my table. When he sat at David's table in a kingly garment, made a prince again, no one could see he was lame. Oh, I like that. When I come to Christ... 
and he clothes me with his righteous. I am still lame. I still don't do everything right. In word and thought and deed, I fall short of the law of God every day, every day. I'm still crippled, but I'm at the king's table now. I have the robe of righteousness and the angels can't see my deformed, crippled feet. They're covered by the robe. That's the gospel. Let's take a break.